one of the one of the reasons that we ask you guys to to kind of talk to each other. Um, I have a really, really great privilege in this church to be uh, the campus pastor. And one of, the, one of the things that I get to do with my job is I, I get to meet a lot of you. Uh, I have never been one to say no to a cup of coffee, more specifically a latte. But over the, uh, the last couple of months in this role, uh, maybe for the first time I've been over-caffeinated. Uh, I've, I've gotten the opportunity to sit down with a lot of you. And the more people that I sit down with at Mission City Church, the more I learn and understand that we have truly incredible people that we get to share this community with. And um, one of the sad things is that we don't really take the time, whether it be out of our comfort zone or whatever the reason may be, we don't really take the time to get to know other people. And I believe that, that if you guys are praying for each other, that we can really accomplish something incredible in our community. And, and uh, just looking around the room, I'm just so honored to worship with you guys. I really am. And so thank you for being here this morning. Um, if you haven't noticed yet, uh, I am Pastor Josh, not Dustin. And, uh, and I'm going to be bringing the word this morning. I get the privilege and honor to do that. Um, I just want to say before, before we get started, we're going we're to pray before we get started. I want to pray for, for, for Pastor Dustin. Um, he, is, he is awesome. And I'm, I'm so grateful to get to work here and work with Pastor Dustin, work for him. And, uh, and I want you to know just from someone, I, I've uh, done youth ministry, uh, primarily youth pastorship for, for the better part of the last decade. And even for youth, you know, it is a, a, a big weight that weighs on you every single week to, to not just like pray and, and seek the Lord just for you personally, but on top of that, to kind of pray and go, God, what, what do you have for, for, for the people, you know, that, that are going to get to come and, and that we're going to get to share with them. And so having that weight, you know, um, on a consistent basis, you know, every once in a while, Pastor Dustin just needs a couple weeks off and I get it. I really get it. And so I'm so honored to be someone that he trusts, uh, to be able to come here and deliver a word. And, and, uh, and I just want to pray for him this morning, and we'll pray for the service, if you would join me. Father, we just come to you this morning, and we thank you for the great privilege of, of just being in your presence. Lord, this morning, if nothing else happens, God, I just pray that you be honored. I pray that we glorify you with what we do in this place. And Lord, I, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would have your way this morning. And we lift up Pastor Dustin and his family, and we thank you for him. We thank you for his leadership. We thank you for the vision that he provides to this house. Um, we thank you um, just for all that he does behind the scenes that nobody will ever see. All the contributions and every way that he is a part of, of making this thing a reality. And Lord, I pray that you would bring just refreshing to his spirit. Lord David prayed, uh, renew a right spirit within me. I pray that for him this morning. I pray that you would grant him an abundance of wisdom and favor. And, um, and when he comes back, let him come back strong, ready, and refreshed. We thank you for that. We love you. In your name we pray. Everybody said? Amen. 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 Um, this morning we, uh, we, we are going to be talking about something that kind of follows suit with what we've been talking about in Reality St. Pete for this last semester. If you don't know what Reality St. Pete is, it's our young adults um, group that, that meets. It is a, with these guys, they're very specific. You have to get the verbiage right. It is a gathering for young adults, ages 18 to 28. They have a community where they just uh, have a gospel message. And, and uh, over this last semester, we've really been going through this topic of, of breaking out. That was a word that, um, that God put on, so weird to say JT, Josh Smith, JT Smith. I'm trying, I'm trying to, to stick with that. It's a word that <laughs> the Lord gave to JT about breakout. And so we've been kind of following along this idea of, of breaking out of like bad habits, breaking out of depression. This is my favorite one, breaking out of the mediocre life of a casual Christian. And as I was praying about what, what, uh, what to bring in this topic, something that really stuck with me was the idea of breaking in. So it was a little bit different 
than to break out. And uh, if, you'll, if you'll give me some time here, we'll, we'll go through and I'll, I'll explain to you why that was something that was on my heart. But we're going to be in the book of Judges this morning. If, um, if you don't read the Old Testament, let me encourage you. Read it. It is so good. It is so full of all the juicy drama that you don't necessarily get in the New Testament. Like, yes, the hope of Jesus is in the New Testament. It's incredible. But some of my favorite, some of my favorite passages and, and, uh, and stories and stuff that I work through is in the Old Testament. So we're going to be going back to Judges chapter 6 and 7. We're reading a lot of the Bible this morning. That's the only way I know the message is going to be good. So buckle up. We're going to get into it. We're going to go uh, verses 1 through 10 in Judges 6. And, uh, and I'll kind of break it down as, as we go. But verse 1 says that the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. Surprise, surprise, right? This is a, a reoccurring theme in, in the Word of God is that the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. So the Lord handed them over to the Midianites for seven years. The Midianites were so cruel that the Israelites made hiding places for themselves in the mountains, the caves, and the strongholds. Whenever the Israelites planted their crops, marauders from Midian and Amalek and the people of the east would attack Israel, camping in the land and destroying the crops as far away as Gaza. They left the Israelites with nothing to eat. Everybody say nothing. I know there's more than four of y'all in the house. Everybody say nothing. All right. Left them with nothing to eat, taking all of the sheep, goats, cattle, and donkeys. These enemy hordes coming with the, these enemy hordes coming with their livestock and tents were as thick as locusts. They arrived on droves of camels too numerous to count. And they stayed until the land was stripped bare. So Israel was reduced to starvation by the Midianites. Then the Israelites cried out for help. I find it very interesting that during this entire series of, of years going by where they're being attacked by the Midianites and all of their stuff is being stripped and they finally get to a place of starvation, then at that point, then they cried out to the Lord. Why is it that sometimes we see prayer as a last resort instead of a first resource? Like, do you believe in the same Bible that says that, that Jesus Christ is our Savior, that God sent His one and only Son, right? Do you believe that same Bible? Because that same Bible says that prayer moves the hand of God. That same Bible says that the prayers of a righteous man availeth much. Sorry, ladies. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. But I think it's so important for us to understand that prayer is a resource. It is not to be a last resort. But here they are, starving to death, and they cry out to the Lord. Verse 7 says that when they cried out to the Lord because of Midian, the Lord sent a prophet to the Israelites. He said, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought you up out of slavery in Egypt. I rescued you from the Egyptians and all those who oppress you. I drove out your enemies and gave you their land. I told you that I am the Lord your God. You must not worship gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live but you have not listened to me. Would you say the Israelites were in a place that they were stuck? For me, this message is, is for, for those of us this morning that feel stuck. Maybe you feel stuck in a plateau of, of, of what your relationship with the Lord looks like. Maybe you feel stuck in a place where you go, I, I don't know that I could ever truly give my life to God. I'm not worthy. Or maybe you're saying I'm facing an impossible situation in my life. How do I get through that? How do I get past a place of being stuck this morning? And really, this story of, of, of Gideon, it kind of shows us these steps that take place. Because I believe that everything that is in the Bible is there for a reason. And if we really look at this story, have you ever read something in the Bible and you just go, wait, what, what does that mean? I'll just skip it to the thing that makes sense, right? So sometimes, sometimes I'm guilty of doing that. But I've learned to like read the Bible and go, well, why does it say this? And so as we go through this, uh, this story of Gideon, I, I want to break down a couple of the things. And the first thing is I love that they cried out and the Lord sent, is what it says. They cried out and the Lord sent a prophet, right? Your miracle may not be on next day delivery or maybe on same day delivery like Amazon. How do they do that? Your miracle may not be on same day delivery, but I can tell you that as soon as you cry out, God responds. He puts into place something that is going to come to your rescue. I, I believe that. 
he, they cried out, and the Lord responded. And the first thing that they did is God sent a prophet, and what, is, what does the prophet do? He comes to remind the Israelites of who he is and what he has already done for them in the past. I think that that's really important. Like, think about where you're at right now. I've, I've read most of, 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 of the New Testament, like, a lot because I just enjoy it. And there's, like I said in the beginning, there's this theme that the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight. There's this constant cycle, right, of, of God, we need you. He sends help. Thank you. And then they go and sin again. And then they're like, oh, God, I need you. He sends help. Thank you. Sin again. Like, they're in this constant cycle, and I just think, how dumb are they? Like, did, especially in the Old Testament. You, you, you go, God literally split a Red Sea for them to walk through. I've oftentimes wondered what that looked like. I saw the movie, there was a movie that came out not long ago, I forget what it was called, but it was about uh, God rescuing the Israelites from Egypt. And I remember thinking just how underwhelming they made that scene. If you saw the movie, it was almost like the water just kind of like pushed over and then it was like normal waves on the side. I'm thinking, I'm like, come on, man. I, I wish I was there and it was like walls of water and you could see like fish swimming in the water. Like, dang, walking through. Like, how cool would that be? So I'm, I'm gonna go ahead and stick with that mindset in, in, in my head. But, you know, they, they do this in, in incredible miracle. And then after that, they're like, well, where do we go? And all of a sudden there's, a, there's a, a pillar of smoke like to lead them and fire to guide them where they're supposed to go. And then they go and sin and they create some false idol. You're like, how, how are you so dumb? And I think about my life and where I'm at and I go, I, I come to a place where I'm facing either financial struggles or, or anger issues or like whatever it is. You come to that place and then you go, God, like, God help me. And he goes, do you remember what I've already done for you? Like, are you praying to me right now with doubt in your heart? Because I want to remind you first, because that's what he does. He sent, he sent the prophet to tell the Israelites, remember, I rescued you out of Egypt. You were slaves for 400 years. And then I sent plagues to the Egyptians and Pharaoh so that he would release you because you are my people. I provided all these miracles to get you to a place where you are in the promised land, right? Remember that not only am I capable, but I'm willing if you will cry out. I'm willing. And so there's, there's that part, right? The, the steps is that they cried out he sent a prophet to remind them. And then the next part is that he told them, he says, he says in, in, in verse 10, I told you I'm the Lord your God. You must not worship the gods of the Amorites in whose land you now live, but you have not listened to me. What is it that we're doing that we're not listening to God? What has he told us to do that we're not listening to? Because oftentimes that gets us into a place where we're stuck. We haphazardly, without really thinking about it, begin to fall into a life of sin. And, and, and you know, for me, what I realize is the sin that I am most guilty of is not a sin of like going, going out to the club or, or to the strip club. Like I'm never really tempted with doing drugs or anything crazy like that. It's, it's the sin of omission that really gets me. It's not what I'm doing, it's what I'm not doing that I'm supposed to be doing that hinders me the most. Because what does the, what does the Bible say is the two most important commandments? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor, and like it, love your neighbor as yourself. Let's go back to the first part, though. What am I doing on my daily life that shows I'm loving the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength? Because sometimes I get so caught up and looking at this, how many of y'all got an iPhone in here? If you got an iPhone on Sundays, something happens. Do y'all get that little reminder on Sunday mornings? It's like, hey, here's your weekly usage report. I was on the phone that much? Oh my, it's like I have to repent every Sunday. I'm like, Lord, how did I spend an average of five hours a day on my phone? What in the world? And it's, it's like, it's never the big things that really stop you 
For some of us it is, but I mean, a lot of times what it is, it's the little things that just add up and they create this blockade to where truly I'm not living out the most important commandment, which is to love the Lord my God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. Because if I was living that way, my life would look different. And so for you this morning, I want you to ask yourself, what is it that he's told me to do that, that I'm not listening? Because that's what the prophet wanted to remind Israel of. This is what I've done for you. And this is what I told you to do, that you weren't listening. Verse 11 through 13 says, Then the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree at Ophrah, which belonged to Joash, the clan of Abiezar. Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of a wine press to hide the grain from the Midianites. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. Sir, Gideon replied, If the Lord is with us, then why has all of this happened to us? And where is all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. When I was reading the commentary, I thought it was interesting, the word that they used for the, uh, sir literally kind of implied that Gideon, when he heard this, looked around as if to say, is God talking to someone else? Hey, mighty hero, sir? Who? Me? And then he proceeds along the same path that I feel like all of us do. Sir, if you are with me, why is all this happening? Why, why, why am I going through this thing if you're with me? I heard stories of my ancestors about miracles that have happened. Where's the miracles at today? How come I haven't seen that, right? And this is something that, that I always say that just resonates with me because I want to make sure that I'm doing my part. Is that oftentimes I go, God, I want to see you do something I've never seen you do before. But is God asking me, I want to see you do something I've never seen you do before. Like get committed. Pursue me. Actually live out that command that I gave you to love me with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Could you imagine a committed people to God? And don't get me wrong, I still think you're a Christian if you post a verse from the YouVersion app. You're probably a great Christian if you read that verse, you know, the daily verse, five days in a row. Like, that's powerful. But the truth is, I just believe that it's more than that. I believe that there's a, a, a deeper level. I believe that, that God is calling us to a higher standard. I believe that. And so he says, why is all of this happening to me if you are with me? Sometimes I get so consumed with asking God why that I forget to say yes. Yes, I will give that thing up. Yes, I will go and, and give. I will do what you are asking me to do. Yes, Lord. I need to remind myself, stop asking why and just say yes. Verse 14 and 15 says, then the Lord turned to him and said, go with the strength that you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. But Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? I am the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I, am, and, and I am the least in my entire family. I like that he tells him to go in his own strength, and he immediately knows he's unqualified. He's not qualified to do what God is asking him to do, and he knows that he can't do it on his own strength. It's funny when we, we, we talk, about, um, talk about qualified, I, I think about, for me, how crazy it is that I have the opportunity to stand up here and, and speak about the Bible. Like, do, do y'all remember all the way back years and years and years ago to high school when, when you had the, the yearbooks? Do they still do yearbooks? They do? That's awesome. Some traditions last forever. Um, but when, when they did the yearbooks, a lot of times, it, it, uh, when you, whenever you were a senior, you would see the portion in the back of the yearbook that would say, um, most likely to become famous, or like, most likely to work at McDonald's for the rest of your life, or 
most likely to go to jail, like those kind of things. <clears throat> if there was a section that said most likely to be in ministry, dude, <laughs> I'd have been on the opposite end of the book. I was, I was so dumb when I was a kid. Like I, even now I'm dumb. Like I'm so unqualified to do this, but the truth is God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the called. If he has put it in your heart, matter of fact, Pastor Dustin had said this before. He said, if he instills it, he will fulfill it. That gives me great comfort to know that, that I'm not alone in the fact that God is asking me to do something that I'm not qualified to do. I'm just not. And here's Gideon saying, how is this supposed to happen? How am I going to do this? Verse 16 and 17 says that the Lord said to him, I will be with you. Stop right there. That's all I need to know. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not qualified to do this. I'm, I'm not qualified to do a lot of things. But if the Lord says, hey, I will be with you, cool. That's, that's all I need to know. When I'm weak, you are strong. And where I, I can't make it, you will. I know that. The Lord said to him, I will be with you. And you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. Gideon replied, if you are truly going to help me, show me a sign. Prove to me that it is really the Lord speaking to me. I've read that in the past and thought, dude, you're, how are you going to question God? What's wrong with you? But you know what's funny is, is I question God whenever he goes, hey, go talk to that dude at the gas station and buy him something to eat. And I'm like, oh, Lord, you getting a little bit of confirmation? You sure? <laughs> that guy? Looks a little bit scary. If you'll protect me, I'll, I'll go. <laughs> and I will sacrifice this $1.25 because I trust you, God, right? Gideon is facing something that literally is impossible. Is gonna, he's going to lose his life like that if he pursues what the Lord is telling him to do. And so he's asking God, give me a little bit of confirmation. And I don't see anything wrong with that. Because the Lord will give you confirmation. Verse 25 through 32 says that that night the Lord said to Gideon, take the second bull from your father's herd, the one that is seven years old, pull down your father's altar to Baal, cut down the Asherah pole standing beside it. Then build an altar to the Lord your God here on this hilltop sanctuary. Laying down the stones carefully, sacrifice the bull as a burnt offering on the altar, using as fuel the wood from the Asherah pole that you cut down. So Gideon took 10 of his servants and did as the Lord commanded, but he did it at night because he was afraid of the other members of his father's household and the people of the town. So early the next morning, as the people of the town began to stir, someone discovered that the altar of Baal had been broken down and the Asherah pole beside it had been cut down. In their place, a new altar had been built, and on it were the remains of the bull that had been sacrificed. The people said to each other, who did this? After asking around and making a careful search, they learned that it was Gideon, the son of Joash. Bring out your son, the men of the town demanded for, of Joash. He must die for destroying the altar of Baal and cutting down the Asherah pole. But Joash shouted to the mob that confronted him, Why are you defending Baal? Will you argue his case? Whoever pleads his case will be put to death by morning. But if Baal is truly a god, then let him defend himself and destroy the one who broke down his altar. From then on, Gideon was called Jeroboam, which means let Baal defend himself because he broke down Baal's altar. I read that and immediately it reminded me that if I want breakthrough in my life, I have to clean house. They had an altar set up to a false god. Today in this world, in this culture where we're at, our false gods don't come in the form of a statue. It's not so easily recognized. Like I said, five hours a day? Is, is, is this become a god for me? I can't even study the Bible on this thing because I'm sitting here reading, I'm like, oh man, that's good. Look at Gideon. Yeah, that story, you asked for confirmation. Oh, someone, okay. They didn't just like my status, they commented. I mean, I, I, I got to see what they comment. What do they say? Oh, yeah, that's really nice of them. Hold on, they got a new job? Well, they comment on my status. Let me comment on theirs. Oh, three, three hours later, I'm like, oh, man, I was, I was reading about Gideon. Isn't it funny how, how the enemy can, like, sneak his way in 
to completely distracting you from building your relationship with the Lord stronger? It's, he's so cunning and manipulative. It's, it's crazy. And this, this passage right here, this part made me go, God, what have I set before you in my life? What have I given more time, attention, and effort than you? There's a song called uh, Clear the Stage by a guy named Jimmy Needham. And, and that song says, um, anything I give all of my time to is an idol. God, I don't want there to be anything else that's an idol in my life. And the truth is, I, I, I look at what God asks for me to do, and I, I read where the Word of God tells me to love Him, right? I, I read where it says to forgive. I, I read where, where it says to love others as myself. And, and I see all of these different things, and it says don't harbor bitterness or anger. And, and, and it says be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. And I see all of these things, and I go, truly, God wants what's best for me. He doesn't tell me to do certain things and not do certain things because he wants to take joy out of my life. Matter of fact, the Bible says that Jesus came to give us life and life more abundant. And so when I, when I look at it, I have to understand that God has given me things to say and, and, and make sure that he is the only idol, the only God in my life for a reason. And that reason, really at the end of the day, is because that's where I'm going to find the things that I can't buy. Like love, joy, peace, patience, self-discipline, the fruits of the Spirit. I only find those things by truly following God. And it's, it's, it's funny because I think about this, uh, this principle of it's better to give than to receive. Better for who? <laughs> Listen, my wife is the most generous person in the world. We get paid and she's like, let's give it all away. Come on. I need some new shoes. And she's like, you already have five pairs. No, but you, you think about this principle, right? It's a biblical principle that God has given us. And I even see people who don't serve God follow this principle and be blessed. Because I think about like a missionary, right? I sat down this last, this last week with, with, a, with a couple from our church that lived in Haiti for 15 months and they're going back for three months over the summer to help build a place uh, where they can have safe C-sections. And, and when they went over there, they didn't come back and go, man, they sure are lucky that we went. Hope they're grateful. You'll never see somebody go on a mission trip and come back with that mindset. Like how many of you guys were a part of Night to Shine, right? Like did you go to Night to Shine? Yeah. Did you go to Night to Shine and then at the end be like, man, they're really, ha they're really lucky to have us. I hope they're grateful because we worked really hard on that. Heck no. You went, if you went to there or you went to a mission trip, you come back and go, man, I went there with the intention of blessing, but man, it changed my life. It completely wrecked me. It, it changed me. I was, I oftentimes hear people on mission trips say, I was way more blessed than I was a, a blessing. That's just the way it works. It's better to give than it is to receive. You see, the problem with the Midianites and, and the Amalekites and this huge army that had a number that was too big to count. The problem was not that they were so strong. The problem was that the Israelites were so disobedient. Let me say it again. It's not that your circumstance or, or what you're facing is too strong. It's just sometimes that you're too disobedient. What is it that God is saying, give this to me? Pursue that. Can we be obedient? and watch God work in our lives? The next part of the story is that Gideon began to test the Lord because why, why would you not? I mean, I'm not, I'm not gonna go after an army that I, I can't even count how many enemies I'm facing without asking God for a little more confirmation. So Gideon's like, all right, if this is really you, Lord, I'm gonna put out this fleece right here. And when I wake up in the morning, I want it to be wet with the dew and I want everything else to be dry. <laughs> That's not gonna happen. Goes to sleep, wakes up the next morning, comes out, and he's like, oh, snap. Uh, that's wet and everything else. Okay, that could have been just a coincidence. Let me ask one more time. I want the fleece to be dry in the morning and everything else to be wet with the dew. That probably won't happen. He wakes up the next morning. Oh. Are you ever, like, reluctant to say yes, but you know you should? 
Gideon finally said, yes, I will do what you're asking me to do. So him and 32,000 Israelites got together and they started marching their way to encounter the Midianite army. And the Lord says, hey, Gideon, yeah. Hey, if, if any of the people that are with you are scared, tell them to go home. What? I want to be sure that you and all of Israel knows that it is I who pro provided this miracle. So I want you to send home the people who are scared. Out of 32,000 men, 22,000 of them went home for they were scared. So 10,000 remained. And so they're, they're continuing their, their, uh, their pursuit of the Midianites. And God says, hey, Gideon, what? He said, you still have too many. I want you at the next rest stop. I want you to pay attention. Everyone at that rest stop, whenever you get to get a drink that sticks their head down in the water and drinks like this without looking, I want you to send them home. Only the people who keep their eyes open on what's happening and drinks out of their mouth like this, the ones who are aware, I want you to keep them. 300 remained. Sounds like a movie. Only 300 remained. I'm convinced that sometimes God wants your situation to look impossible because he wants you to know that he will get the glory. God's gonna get the glory for the impossible situation that you are facing. God's gonna get the glory. Verse eight through 15, it says that the Midianite camp was in the valley just below Gideon. That night the Lord said, get up and go down to the Midianite camp for I have given you victory over them. But if you are afraid to attack, go down to the camp with your servant Pura. Listen to what the Midianites are saying and you will be greatly encouraged. Then you will be eager to attack. Of course, Gideon is scared. So him and Pura go down to the edge of the enemy camp. The armies of, of, of Midian and Amalek and the people of the east had settled in the valley like a swarm of locusts. Again, it's wanting you to understand that the camels were like the grains of the sand of the seashore, too many to count. Gideon crept up just as a man was telling his companion about a dream. The man said, I had this dream and in my dream, a loaf of barley bread came tumbling down into the Midianite camp. It hit a tent, turned it over and knocked it flat. His companion answered, your dream can only mean one thing. God has given Gideon, the son of Joash, the Israelite, victory over the Midian and all of its allies. When Gideon heard this dream and its interpretation, he bowed and worshiped before the Lord. Then he returned to the Israelite camp and shouted, get up for the Lord has given you victory over the Midianite hordes. So Gideon gets his 300 men and they go and surround this army camp to the best of their ability, 300 around this camp and, and all they bring is their trumpet and the jars of clay. And they have a fire of, of a torch. And so what they do all on Gideon's count is they smash the jar, light their torch and they blow their horn for God and for Israel. And all of a sudden Midianites go crazy and they think they're, they're attacking us. And so they start to kill each other and then they run off and they're defeated. There's an incredible breakthrough, right? And that only happened because of three things. Number one, they cried out to the Lord. Let me be very clear. None of this happens, none of this starts until we repent, until we cry out and say, God, I need your help. God, I need you. They understood that they could not do it on their own. They were stuck and they cried out for help. Number two, Gideon responded with action. He eventually said, I will go. Some of us in here have been on that eventually stage for too long. What intention needs to become an action for you this morning? You have been intending for too long. What is the action that the Lord is asking you to move on in your life this morning? And then last but not least is Gideon trusted God. He was willing to break in. He was willing to break in to get the victory. And let me say this, victory did not come overnight. Victory came with obedience. For you in this place this morning, I wanna tell you that, that victory may not seem like it's coming like this. It's not on next day delivery, but when you cried out, the Lord heard you. 
And that victory is gonna come with obedience. If they didn't wipe out those altars to the idols, the false idols, I don't know that it ever would have came. They had to repent, put only their Lord and their God in front of them, and then they had to move forward and be obedient to what God was calling them to do. And the victory came. The song.